Hey, y'all. Jill Gavargazian here, the director, producer, and co-writer of The Stylist, which I believe you all are about to discuss. I am so honored that you've chosen the film as a topic for the podcast. This project is incredibly personal to me. It's something I've been working on for seven years, I just realized, because it started as a short film that we released back in 2016. And ever since, we've been working on the feature script. And we're so excited it's out for the world to see. And I hope everyone enjoys it. Thank you. And what's up, everybody, and welcome to Lights, Camera, Exploitation, your guide to exploitive cinema. This is the pod boss, TJ Bowser, and joining me as always is my doppelganger, Kanga Banger, from down under, Mr. Brody Kane. Howdy, howdy, motherfuckers. And the second man on the grassy knoll, Mr. Slick Nick. Yo. Today, we have a doozy of an episode, but first, it's time for your slice of life. Brody, how goes it? Like I say every week, mate, it all goes down this way. Flat out at work, um, working on set again. Um, right, I got to meet the fucking man himself. If you haven't seen my social media, me bragging about it like I have been. <laughs> right, I've just been posting that shit every goddamn where. But I got to meet Steve Bisley, the one, the fucking only, the goose from Mad Max. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, he's like one of the nicest blokes you'll ever fucking meet. He actually pulled me aside on set. And was like, hey, mate, what the fuck's going on? And I'm like, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I'm like, in my head, I'm like, fucking play it cool, play it cool. And yeah, nah, he he literally kept coming up to me in between takes and just talking absolute shit. And, you know, to watch him actually act, um, he did like this five minute scene where it was just of him doing this um, long monologue of dialogue. And it was just really fucking awesome to watch. I mean, he's a true professional. Um, yeah. I mean, it was, I was in awe. I was, I was in shock that, um, yeah, so got to meet him. It was a fantastic time on set. I'm back there next week for a gun shootout scene. So a gun shootout scene, a shootout scene. So yeah, you know, it's <laughs> going to be uh, pretty full on. So Fuck it's going to be great. But other than that, watch this fantastic fucking film. Got to t- talk to Jill on social media. And uh, yeah, other than that, not much else. What about you, Slick Nick? So not a whole ton. Um, mostly working as well as per usual, uh, watching this, uh, doing a lot of research, watching a lot of the behind the scenes content and everything that came with it from the arrow release, um, kind of freaking out. Cause I realized it's, uh, it's all in the same city, uh, <laughs> that I live in, which was awesome to see. Cause you don't see uh, a whole lot, uh, filmed in and around Kansas city. Uh, so that was a, uh, pleasant surprise. Um, I mean, other than that, really not a whole lot. Uh, saw the eclipse, uh, this morning, woke up at three o'clock in the morning, stepped outside, froze my ass off for about 30 minutes to watch that, take some cool pictures, uh, then head back in, uh, not go back to sleep for another two hours. (laughs) So, uh, I was in the office early this morning. (laughs) Uh, but I mean, other than that, really not a whole lot. Got some watch parties and stuff tonight with some friends. We're going to watch a few more movies. Uh, I think Will Smith's new thing that just came out this weekend. Um, But uh, yeah, other than that, really not a whole lot. TJ, what about you? Well, as I say all the fucking time, I did a bunch of podcast stuff. Uh, We just dropped a review of Ghostbusters Afterlife on the website from Rants from the Black Lodge podcast. Go check that out. Very well done episode. Uh, Go watch that movie if you have an opportunity to. The reviews are looking pretty good on the audience side, people. They're looking pretty fucking good. But yeah, watch Lake Placid today, and then I ordered the new Mulholland Drive 4K from Criterion, and I can't wait for that to come in. That'll be here tomorrow. Oh, baby, I can't wait. Ah, more Lynch, more Lynch, more Lynch. But yeah, uh, watching films and just kind of living life right now, trying to... Making it as exciting as I possibly can. But what I am excited for is to talk about this week's film, and that is The Stylist from 2020. Hi. Right this way. So, what's the plan? I wish my hair would do that. But we all want what we don't have. I guess we all want what we don't have. This is amazing. Can't wait to see this with the dress. Oh, neither can I. (laughs) So, 
house to a wedding madness. Getting married turns you into such a narcissist. Yeah. <laughs> I am actually nervous. Yeah. It's gonna be great. I love you. Tell me about you, Claire. I do hair. You get to go in and out of people's lives. You hear stories. The hairstylist. She's creepy. Doesn't look naturally know her. You give life advice. I guess we all want what we don't have. It's almost like having a family. Are you okay? Stupid! <sighs> what are you doing? And that is from director Jill Gavar Gizion, who also did Grammy in 2015, a short, Dark Web in 2017, the segment Call Girl, One Last Meal in 2019, a short, writers Eric Havens, Eric Stoltz, and Jill Gavar Gizion. Story by cinematographer Robert Patrick Stern, who also worked on The Glass House in 2014, Skeletons in the Closet in 2018, and Friend Request in 2020. Music by Nicholas Ellert, who worked on Deadweight in 2012, 42 Counts in 2018, a short. That is another one of Jill's gag the clown in 2018 production design sarah sharp who also worked on the hollow in 2016 olympia in 2018 and broadcast signal intrusion in 2021 and costume designer Haley sharp who worked on films such as demons in 2017 working man in 2019 and hunter's creed now you have some information about the kickstarter budget mr slicknick i do uh believe the kickstarter uh ended up actually making around, I believe it was $61,000 over time. I think it was a few hundred backers. Um, So a lot of them were, uh, give it a lot. (laughs) And I will uh, elaborate on that more in the additional info. Fucking A, starring Najara Townsend as Claire, who was in True Love in 2008, Contracted in 2013, and Wolf Mother in 2016. Jennifer Seward as Sarah, who starred in Nightcap in 2011, a short Terminal in 2018, and I Am Lisa in 2020. Brie Grant as Olivia, who was in Halloween 2 2009, A Ghost Story in 2017, and Lucky in 2020. Davis D. Rock as Charlie, who worked on Jayhawkers in 2014, Gotcha in 2015, and The Land in 2019. Sarah McGuire as Dawn. You may know her from House of Forbidden Secrets in 2013, The Tree in 2017, and Below the Fold in 2021. Millie Milan as Monique, who was in Kiki Meets the Vampire in 2014, Bone Hill Road in 2017, and Clown Nato in 2019, and the most important member of the cast, Pepper, as Pepper, which is Jill's dog. (laughs) Nick? Claire is a lonely hairstylist who secretly murders and scalps her clients. When Olivia makes the well-intentioned mistake of asking Claire to style her hair for her wedding, she becomes dangerously obsessed and her sanity starts to slip away with bloody consequences. Fucking A. So it won a couple of awards, including Fright Fest 2020 Best Actress, Najara Town said, winner, winner, chicken dinner. Stigis, Catalonial International Film Festival in 2020, Best Motion Picture, Jill Nominee. Fright Fest 2021, Rising Star Award, Najara Town said, Nominee. Florida Film Festival in 2021, Best Narrative Feature, Jill Gavargazian, Nominee. And Panic Fest in 2021, Best Actress, Najara Town said, Winner, Winner, Chicken Dinner. Boys, let's get physical. So we got the sweet release from Arrow Video that was dropped June 8th, 2021. It's not rated and it runs 100 in five minutes. And it features a high definition Blu-ray 1080p presentation, an original DTS HD master audio 5.1, optional English subtitles for the deaf and hard of hearing, reversible sleeve featuring original and newly commissioned artwork by Sarah Deck, double-sided fold-out poster, illustrated collector's booklet featuring new writing on the film by Emma Westwood in the gallery of exclusive location, Scouting Photographs. Audio commentary by co-writer, producer, director, Jill Gavar Gazian, and actress, producer, Najara Townsend. Exclusive Blu-ray introduction by Jill Gavar Gazian. The Invisible Woman, an exclusive visual essay by author and critic,
critic Alexandra Heller Nichols, exploring the themes of women's labor and female killers in the stylist and horror cinema. The stylist behind the scenes, a series of eight behind the scenes featurettes on different aspects of the film's production, featuring interviews with the cast and crew, a location scouting featurette, outtakes, the original Kickstarter video, the 2016 stylist short that inspired this, Pity, a 2000. 16 short film from the stylist editor John Pata and the executive produced by Jill. Teaser trailer, theatrical trailer, image galleries, and a CD containing the original soundtrack. And it is a fucking banger. Currently on Amaro Video for $28 or Amazon for $19.99 if you want to pay Jeff Bezos. Boys, what'd you learn? <clears throat> so, um, I actually learned a few things. Apparently, the full film of The Stylist could be considered a sequel to the original short film, or at least has a nod to the original, as the victim from the short film, Mandy, uh, her scalp is actually seen among Claire's collection in the basement at the beginning of the feature film. I made that connection myself, and that seeing that scalp kind of made me want to go watch the, the short because I was like there's more and that's how I read yeah. that's how I naturally saw it, that the short was like a prequel to this so mm, I watched the short immediately after finishing the movie and I was I, like I need to see it <laughs> and I, I like how it kind of the short and the feature mirror each other and I think that that's kind of also shows the way that she acts it's kind of like she's in a routine and she does things a specific way so having it mirror each other is just kind of pretty damn cool you know and it makes sense yeah Najar's uh, Claire actually seems like a little more laid back in the short Mm-hmm. And like a little, a little bit less awkward than she is in the full feature. I think it really ramps I like up that it, by the feature, though. Like, yeah, yeah. I like that it flushed her out a lot more. Mm-hmm. So, in addition to Mandy's scalp reappearing in the feature film, her voice can also be heard as an audio flashback that plays as Claire is putting on the hair and talking to herself in the mirror towards the end of the movie. Yeah, it's a cool little bit when she puts the hair on; she can kind of hear their voices and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I really liked that. <laughs> um, so. Uh, In the Invisible Woman visual essay, uh, she explains that the concept behind having Claire work as a hairstylist uh, to base the plot of the movie around actually stems from Givar Gizian's uh, having experience working in the field as she was, I apparently thought at the time previously a hairstylist until TJ uh, let me know that she's still doing that job as well um, and drew inspiration from the interactions that she had with many of her usual clients yeah, according to the commentary, which I guess is pretty recent, she still works there, so which is pretty fucking rad. <laughs> and if you follow her on Instagram, you will see the other well, the other day she was actually in that same hairdressing salon, mm. so it was kind of cool to see that. So the stylus was partially funded by crowdfunding on Kickstarter, eventually making over sixty-one thousand dollar dues to start working on the project, with one of the higher tier backers, Gary Cooper, actually appearing in the film with a cameo as Gary. Claire's male client that comes into the store as Dawn's brother-in-law comes in to hand out missing persons flyers. Gary Cooper! Well done, Gary. Thank you for helping make this thing a reality. (laughs) Um, So, in the the behind-the-scenes short as well uh, that comes with this, designing the stylist, production manager Austin Wagner actually describes scouting the location for the entrance to Claire's collection room, her little lair in the basement. It's incredible. Uh, He says... Oh, it's great. He says, one of the biggest things that came up in pre-production was that of Claire's entrance. uh, And that entrance, I always believed that it was going to be a big thing. So we landed on a location in Kansas City, which is a beautiful old mansion. And that mansion has an amazing front door, an amazing backyard, and it has this amazing cellar door. And when I saw this cellar door for the first time and the condition that it was in, I didn't know how we could not shoot. Fucking A. It is awesome. It's amazing. And I don't want to promote going out and looking for these locations. But (laughs) goddamn it. I want to go find that mansion now, <laughs> now that I know it's going to be. <laughs> so basically, continue, continuing on the description of the lair, Jill states that they designed it to resemble an animal's nest, with production designer Sarah Sharp explaining, when an animal starts like getting comfortable in a situation, no matter if the situation seems like chaos, like if it's leaves, leaves, and sticks, or like mud, or whatever it is, it doesn't matter how it seems to anyone else that is their little comfort bubble. And that was what I wanted to do with as Claire grew in her hair. And that 
was what I wanted with as Claire grew in her confidence as a serial killer or her insecurity as a person. Whatever it was that she grew in, I, I just wanted it to start becoming this three, 360 little nest with every shot to be romantic, to be beautiful, but to also have this funeral feel with the candles and the stacking. Fucking A. In an interview with Entertainment Focus 2020, director Jill Gavargizian talks about Najara Townsend reprising her role from the short to the feature. Najara is an incredible talent. I can't believe she's not in huge films yet. I've said this many times, but this film would simply not work without her. She constantly wows me every time I watch it. Claire is a very introverted character, and Najara expresses so much in subtle ways without saying a word. She kept the character grounded and relatable while doing these horrible outlandish things, which is a huge feat. She also taught me the importance of not just creating a backstory for a character, but creating super specific memories that shape the character into who they are today. It also amazes me that she's not in bigger stuff now because in doing the research for this, I found out she's been acting in movies since at least 2000. In an interview with uh, our director, Jill, over at Ready Steady Cut in 2021, knowing that Jill's background is in hairdressing, she was asked whether the stylist was based on a true story. Jill states, well, I definitely joked that we should add that at the start of the film based on a true story because there was a period in horror when it appeared in so many films. So can you add that in if just a tiny part, if it's based on truth? Me being a hairstylist is true. But no, I do not want or have ever scalped anybody. Almost seven years ago, the thought just came to me. How is there not already a hair stylist horror movie? That came from Robert Rodriguez's teaching of on indie filmmaking. He really preaches that idea that when you, when you're starting out and you don't have millions of dollars lying around, you just look at what you have access to that's unique. That's anything from locations to props to specific wardrobe, anything that you can write around and build an idea. Partly that, the knowledge I have access to salons as locations and the realization that this is not already a thing. So I decided I'm going to do it. I grew up a huge horror fan. I'm doing hair in this salon. This will be like everything that I am and love all at once. There was a Toby Hooper nod in the film whenever uh, yeah. the voice over the ah. intercom calls for Toby to come to the front. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. And Nick will maybe talk a little bit about that reference. Well, not ah. Reference, but. <laughs> um, by proxy, by proxy. <laughs> when asked what influenced Jill to make the film, uh, she had replied, this goes back to my love of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, my favorite horror film of all time. Back when I first envisioned Claire, I saw her as a hairstylist version of him. I saw her in her lair, or whatever you would call it, where the souvenirs from her previous victims were displayed like hunting trophies. And I imagined her wearing one and being lost in it along with the personality of whoever it belonged to. That's kind of how I interpret Leatherface, in the original at least. He behaves differently according to what mask he's wearing. He changes his wardrobe to go with the mask. He's even further removed from reality. We never see him as him but only with a mask. That actually got me thinking about an interesting difference. Claire isn't always under a quote-unquote mask, but if she was, anyway, it started like that. And I realize not everyone feels this way about Leatherface, but what I love about the original film is it was the first to give us a little bit of the villain side of the story. We got to know the family better than any of the iconic slashers which were presented in a one-dimensional way intentionally a lot of the time. Leatherface is like the child of the family, maybe raised this way and never been in society. So to him, this is just life. So that was one starting point, but also I have a love for anti-hero stories. I can actually think of a line that kind of confirms that whenever uh, she tells Olivia that she needs time away from Charlie and she's like, I wouldn't let you don't say that shit to people. And I'm only telling you this because I genuinely think you don't know. Like when she starts to realize she's like, you don't have social skills, do you? (laughs) (laughs) When asked if the short originally intended as a standalone piece, or a proof of concept for a feature film, Jill replies, It was kind of a mix because when the concept first came to me, I wanted it to be a feature-length film, but I knew that there was no way I was ready at the time to make a feature. So my thought process was, why don't we make the short and then we can start writing a feature version so that the script is ready for when the short comes out. That was the idea. But I didn't have the script ready when the short came out. 
The concept worked well enough on its own to make a good short. I've made some concepts that we don't share public publicly, but this was one seemed like something that could do well. And if it did, that could help us maybe pitch the feature down the line. We didn't know that what would happen when the short came out. It was a wild dream come true, which is why I kicked myself for not having a bigger script ready at the time. We had people asking us straight, is there a feature? And these were exciting companies. But I had to say, yeah, there, there is one but it's not ready yet. That's one of my biggest pieces of advice for other filmmakers. Try to package it all and have it ready when the short is premiered. They say, be prepared for success. But I think that means to be prepared for the most amazing opportunity happening. If you're not ready, you have to pass it up. It turned out to be helpful that we were writing the feature while we were taking feedback on the shot because it was also influenced how we approached the feature. Jill talks about the crew from the short to the feature. Uh, we tried to bring back as many people as we could. They had done a great job, but also it's like a family to me, a loyalty thing. If there's an opportunity that came from the short they worked on, I wanted to give that back to the same people. Also, there's people that had been invested in the character, marinating on her for five years or so. So when it came time, they were ready. It was so exciting to work with Nicholas Ellert on the score, but seeing him work on something bigger than 12 minutes was such an undertaking, but just such a cool experience. And the score so for this movie is great. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. Mm. So we have Jill talking about working with Nicholas Alert on the score. We've got so many compliments about the score. It would be great to release it in some way. Working with him is so cool because he's like some sort of musical genius. Musicians amaze me because I don't understand how this stuff comes out of them. With him, we'd go through the film and discuss how we wanted it to feel because the whole film is intended to bring you into Claire's perspective and the camera, music, everything brings you into her world. Normally in a horror film, we would try to make you scared, but in this one, we're trying to get get you into the into the killer's side. It was really interesting because there are some scenes where she's stalking people. For example, we don't want to present what it feels like to be stalked, but instead, what is it like to hunt? We talked about a hunting sound and the emotions to go with it, and I have no idea how he turns that into music. And finally, Jill discusses what's next for the future. There are a few different things that I'm working on. I'm helping to produce my friend John Potter's next film. He's actually how I met most of the team on the stylist. We're like a tight little family that likes to help each other's stuff get made, and I do like to produce other people's work as well as directing my own stuff. I'm into finding what we need to get things done, and then getting it done. But I have a couple of projects I'm attached to as director that I'm excited about, but I don't think I can talk about them much in detail though. They're both in the thriller horror world, and one is with the writers of Fangoria's Porno, a crazy horror comedy. There's kind of a game where we've got all films in that state, but can't really talk about them because who knows what's going to happen and what isn't. It was hard before COVID, and now it's even harder. Where can we shoot? When? I don't know how eager people are to finance films because there's so much uncertainty in the air right now. Well, okay, boys, let's tackle about it! Okay, favorite performance of the film. Slick Nick, take it away. Pepper. I'm kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, ah, is there really on anyone else that I can pick besides Najara? I mean, <laughs> she's uh, pretty great. Honestly, like in the short and even more in the feature. Olivia's like, pretty she, cool. Olivia is good. Brea uh, does bring a pretty good performance to that. I mean, she also has plenty of uh, experience in um, acting as well alongside Najara and like TV and things like that. I think she also actually had just directed her own movie as well. I can't remember what the name of it ah. was. Um, but I think she just directed another movie this year. Yes, last year. As well. um, but I mean, just the way that Najara presents the awkwardness of Claire, mm -hmm. like where she kind of toes the line of like people are kind of aware that there's just not quite something right, but they're not sure what. And she's just off enough to be unsettling whenever she's talking with people. And then when you just see everything behind that the veils lifted she's alone in her car she's in her basement she's a home alone anything like that you just see it just full on it's crazy good how well it's done how well it's acted and also how normal she can kind of seem at the same time so like between you know talking to don in the coffee shop waking up and just hey pepper oh do you need to go outside just human stuff uh and then just 
you can see the switch turn like each time when she's decided fuck it i'm killing somebody <laughs> like and then just how that ramps up from the beginning with the very first kill where you almost really can't even see it coming till the wine glass drops and then as it goes up you start to see more and more and more um and it just becomes clearer it becomes more defined as the movie goes on what what headspace she's in um but yeah no I d- i'm gonna have to go with najara um yeah brody what about you i would have to agree with you then nick absolutely um she is amazing playing this character um it's her innocence yeah, it's, it's her innocence that is something that made me sympathize for her character. Um, you know, even when she's trying so hard to please everyone, it's actually, that's really tough to watch. And, yeah. um, you know, when she acts on her violent tendencies, you can see her emotions of like this shock sprawled across her face. But that just goes to show you that she really does still know right from wrong. But however, she is slightly confused and, you know, acting out these urges, it's, it's it's a it's actually really interesting to watch, um, especially Jill's direction for this um, for this character. But it, it really puts you the view into her mind space, and it's it's a fantastic thing to see unfold, um, especially uh, like from a killer's perspective. I'd say so. Yeah, Najara Townsend is a phenomenal actor, and yeah. I mean, what more can I say about it? She's fucking fantastic. I could definitely agree with that, especially like just even in the simple things that everyone can be sympathetic. I, I don't think there's a person on this earth who couldn't couldn't at least somewhat relate to whenever she's sitting in the car critiquing everything she said to Olivia in her head, just being like, that was stupid. That was dumb. Why did I even say that? Like, yeah. <laughs> yeah, I think uh, like you guys said, Najara fucking nails it. You definitely can feel and see the progression of how that character uh, goes a little bit crazier. As uh, the film progresses, yeah. she really sells it on that. I, but I will have to do an honorable mention to Jill's death on screen. She's really good at dying. Uh, <laughs> fucking A. <laughs> nice, nice little cameo, I will admit. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I think uh, yeah, Najara's pretty fucking rad. Favorite set piece. I'll start it off here with the scalp layer in the basement. It is lit gorgeously the production design is on point it is terrifying in the same way that uh what the fuck's his name frank zito's uh bedroom is terrifying oh yeah yeah Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) this is just a lot more stylish (laughs) oh yeah it's it's oh damn yeah absolutely even though like it's yeah like you can't really say fuck all down there it's lit really well you know definitely i had it that it feels felt like something out of a german expression film you know it does dark with its yeah dark shadow play it's antique looking furniture and you know like that those doily looking cloths it just Mm -hmm. makes it feel really gothic and um yeah uh obviously the acting from najara in that scene definitely helps it make it a haunting experience Mm -hmm. like to see unfold yeah i think you couldn't get a better set piece in this film other than the salon itself. I I have to give that an honorable mention because that's lit what, with neon lights and shit. That was really mm-hmm. fucking intriguing to see. The club bathroom is pretty fucking rad. Took mine. Yeah. I was about to, oh, I was was about to say the club. <laughs> I was about to say the club. I really enjoyed it. I, I know we were talking about this before and everything, the, the, the drawing on or at least sort of somewhat stylized uh, towards like Neon Demon um, that Suspiria we mentioned. Suspiria vibes. Suspiria, Neon Demon. I get what Brody's saying about the playing with the shadows and everything with the lair sort of cabinet of Dr. Caligari German expressionist kind of back to like the roots. She's a film fan and you can tell. Yeah, you absolutely can and it's fun. It's fun to watch. This film has a Bergman homage. Like, how how much do you see that in modern cinema? You don't. (laughs) You do not. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah, Uh, I'd have to say Club the club was probably my favorite. It reminded me so much of Neon Demon, and I love that movie. And the lair actually reminded me a bit of, I don't know if you guys saw this one, but it came out last year as well, The Perfection. Um, it was a Netflix movie. Not perfect, but the set design for it was very, very good. Uh, and it was pretty similar to this. Fucking A. Favorite scene and shot, boys. So, Brody, how yes. do you feel about the ultraviolence? Ooh, yeah. I love it. I actually fucking really liked it in this film. I, look, I want to talk more about that in our next okay our next okay. question. I, okay, I, I will. I will just say, like, I will tell you my fucking favorite scene and shot, and I really like that whole lead up to the ending reveal. I mean, I could potentially see it coming a little bit, but the way they filmed yeah. it, it was really nice because mm-hmm. 
You couldn't really see Claire's face, and if you did slightly, they would quickly cut it through the edit to make you keep guessing what you just saw. So, you know, then as we get to the reveal, the pacing and the timing of that scene, um, you know, it's blocked extremely well. Um, I will mention to see everyone's face look like a drop fucking pie after Claire's reveal was fantastic to witness. <laughs> yeah. Because, uh, yeah, fuck everyone in that room. Um, I really sympathize with Claire. And because, <laughs> yeah, I, I'm just glad Claire did what she did and she was happy in the end and to some extent. Nick! But that's just me. That's, that's just me. Fair. What, I what can agree with you on that one for sure. Uh, I, I think leading up to it uh, as – Claire and Olivia were left alone in that room. I kind of, I kind of knew mm-hmm. <laughs> as well, but like with the shot of her walking down the aisle, I was like, maybe I was wrong. Maybe yeah. I'm going to get subverted until the veil got pulled. And I was like, makes ah. you, <laughs> the way it's edited makes you second guess yourself. Yeah. Yeah. That's but cool. it's still, it's still a very effective scene. Yeah. Um, I would say my favorite shot is probably the, the Brian De Palma nod, the split screen. Mm-hmm. of her and Olivia's days as they're starting and going about their lives. Really love, mm-hmm. I love De Palma. Uh, and just, I love how it's all staged blocked and just, it shows the mirror. Cause again, the whole mirroring sort of theme throughout the movie, it just really kind of drives that home. Hey. Um, so yeah, I would say that's probably favorite uh-huh. shot. My favorite scene has got to be when she goes to kill Olivia's friend that made fun of her in the bathroom. Mm-hmm. Whenever she sneaks into the house and goes into, well, her bathroom and ends up hiding in the shower as she goes oh, in. Yes. To, to go, and their heads are right next to each other with just that little paper thing. So purple. interesting oh. about that. There was originally a scene of that couple making out on the porch, I think. And then they cut that because it wasn't from Claire's perspective. And that would have been taking away from her perspective so they just removed that and just had them jump to the aftermath them laying down Clever. yeah That's i can agree with that decision yeah Absolutely. definitely flowed better for sure but yeah honestly i think that was probably one of the most tense scenes for me in the movie because i wasn't sure if i was like am i rooting for claire to not get caught or am i rooting for her to not find her because i think if she does she's just gonna go psycho like berserker on her or something and and the other thing to add to that as well before um her friend like, and the other thing to add to that, before she walks out of the bathroom, Claire makes a noise in the bathtub, and then it, there's like that pause. There's like a pause for like mm-hmm. a couple of seconds. You're like, mm-hmm. "Fuck, she knows she's gone," and then she just brushes it off like it's nothing. And then it's like, "What the fuck?" She's also drunk at that point because that was after they left the club. So she was mm-hmm. she's hammered by that point. Fair enough. Uh, I love the scene where she goes back into Olivia's house at night and goes through everything and like kind of returns the scarf and shit. Uh, mm-hmm. I think that's nuts. And everything that she does in there is absolutely nuts. Of course, we have to talk about the masturbation scene. Uh, it Has is to be absolutely effective and it's, it can be left up to interpretation for sure. Uh, I definitely see it in the way that she was trying to feel more like Olivia. And I think that's the way I interpret the whole film is that she's just trying to feel more like these people because her herself struggles to feel things but anyway anyway uh yeah and my favorite shots would have to be the way that she portrayed the mirroring of the lifestyles with the split screen like the palma does so fucking cool and you see carry vibes oh, throughout God. this film and that's definitely one of them i love it it's fucking utilized great here yeah boys favorite effect and or death well 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 the barista lady <laughs> that is fucking hard to watch. <laughs> Felt so bad remember, for Dawn. <laughs> yeah, before, yeah, sorry, Dawn. Before I even watch this film, TJ's like, there's going to be a fucking scene in here that's going to make you extremely uncomfortable. I'm like, yeah, whatever, man. I can fucking watch anything. <laughs> and then I watch this scene when she starts to scalp her, Claire starts to scalp Dawn, and then run off into her eye. Fuck me. I was literally <sighs> cringing. And you know, uh-huh. I can't deal with that fucking eye bullshit neither know? can i man i'm right with you <laughs> i'm right with you and then for the lady to fucking wake up and be like claire what the fuck and then so claire <laughs> just punches about 30 holes into it like it's brutal as fuck uh, yeah. i love it but fuck me that she was alive the whole time i was like dude what did dawn do to you like she was so nice s- to her yeah, that's what I mean. And she copped it the most. She copped it sweet. Got the worst one. 
<laughs> like straight up after Damn. she left the store open for her to get a coffee at fucking 10 o'clock at night she was like oh it's just you yeah come on in <laughs> i'm gonna thank you i'm gonna kill you for this <laughs> like god damn it, it pays Claire. Not to be nice nick it just pays not to i be guess nice. yeah i just need to be a cynical dick i know i know <laughs> <laughs> what about you guys what did you speak yeah the barista deaths uh pretty fucking rad i do like the first death with the scalping and stuff i like how just clean it is and the way it's filmed is pretty fucking rad uh effect the scalping man i love that effect it's so well done and we see it a couple times and it's it's fucking rad it's all practical and yeah. it's done very well i think the only the like cgi is like the extra blood right I believe so yeah yes you said with That's- the uh, oh sorry I was, you said with the stabbing for dawn she was stabbing a saturated sponge yes. over and over right so yes. it could and i think a sign cgi as well i think a sign uh, like a neon sign somewhere is she said on the commentary mm-hmm. i think it might be for like a strip club or something because what isn't actually a strip club and she wanted a source for light i don't know that's fair no i can see it depending on depending on where she's filmed in kc we have a few places that have like strips with a lot of neon but do and then we oh, have a few okay. places that it's just bare like like if there is neon it's in the window and it's an open sign so like it depends on where they shot that he ever happened to mention in the commentary about the sound effect of the scalp rip because that's just mm-hmm. fucked Ugh. that she never met yeah. it's visceral the sound design is exquisite on this especially it's amazing uh, it's yeah. amazing. Great. I love it. I fucking love it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Especially, like I mentioned, like my favorite scene is like whenever she goes back into Olivia's house when it's nighttime and goes through her shit. The sound design mm-hmm. in that scene is fucking rad. And the music, it oh, just yeah. hits and it's just like, ooh. The scalpings are probably my favorite effect, uh, for sure. They're just so well done. Like I said, you can tell it's all practical and it looks great. Um, I would say death, it kind of has a little bit more to do with the aftermath of it but i would say jill herself's her cameo death um the acting for for it with her bleeding out and everything and then after she's gone she scalps her the just absolute sheer insanity of once she's done she immediately puts it on then sits there and starts watching cartoons like kicking her feet like a kid laughing and everything while she's like eating popcorn or the pizza she was eating her pizza (laughs) And watching it, I was sitting there like, what the actual fuck? <laughs> I'm telling you, it just, that one hit on a different level. Dawn's was visceral and just made me feel bad. That one, I was just like, holy shit. <laughs> Thoughts on story? Um, yeah, I absolutely dig it. And I wor- I think it works so well for a random film about a serial killer hairstylist. Uh, but, it, you know, like it's such a basic premise that it, it definitely shows the daily struggle of uh, how we deal with emotions. Um, more just in more different specifically ways, of course. women. Ab- absolutely. And, and, and the way it all plays out on screen. You know, it, it is full throttle from the word go and we don't really get a chance to feel happy for our lead bit. You know, and said so we just feel miserable with her as a character um, as she falls into this, you know, downward spiral of jealousy and loneliness, pretty much. And you know, the the I what I really appreciated better is that the director Jill was able to trans transcript that from the page and then into beautiful visuals. You know, mm-hmm. to showcase this in a fantastic manner. I mean, the visual imagery of this film is absolutely exquisite, and Jill has outdone herself. I'd have to agree. Uh- I mean, just how they're able to balance just like the animalistic nature of Claire alongside just every sympathetic trait at the same time and just kind of walk that line while also still showing, um, you know, just sort of this is like an exaggerated version of what lonely people have to deal with. This is an exaggerated version of what women have to deal with. And the fact that they can make it relatable to everybody um, is simply just fantastic, honestly. Um, fuck, I lost my train of thought. I straight up, <laughs> I straight up just spaced out. Um, but yeah, no, I, I mean, honestly, it, it's just amazing that they were able to just sort of translate this story into a way that anyone could watch this movie and relate while also be terrified of claire um and also you don't really see very many female serial killers real life or movies um and i know that they drew a lot on like true crime and everything from the visual essay uh that alexandra did um which as a true crime fan was also really cool to see um in particular but i i remember while doing the research for this i i think i came across a review um 
it was one of the only overwhelmingly negative scene. Most of them were all very positive. Some of the ones were a bit mixed or, but I found one where the guy just didn't like it, just hated the movie. And he compared having Claire, having a female serial killer lead to the movie. If you've heard of it, single white female from like 2000 or like the late nineties or something as just like a one-off. Oh, it's a gimmick. I could not fucking disagree with that guy more. (laughs) Uh, I do think the way that they portrayed, uh, Claire and everything in this was well done. It was fantastic, honestly. Uh, yeah. TJ, what about you? Yeah, so I referenced Maniac earlier with the set piece, and I would have to call this a postmodern Maniac. Uh, I absolutely love everything about this. I love the fact that she's a hairstylist, and I love the fact that she scalps people after she drugs them. I think that is just brutal as hell and just a, a very scary way. I actually watch this film with my preteen daughter, whose mother's a hairstylist, and it's freaked her the fuck out. And uh, yeah, I think Jill's a fantastic director, and you can totally see her love for horror and the story in this film. I absolutely love all these characters. I think that they're all very believable, and it's just a very realistic take on a very scary story, honestly. Uh, And it dives into uh, topics of mental health and feminism, and I I think that's uh, totally respectable and, uh, and well done. It's it's great. I would love to see more stuff, but I'll let that transition into my impact and takeaways. And impact is uh, this shows that indie filmmakers and crowdfunded movies can be fucking incredible and also can show how far they really can go. This got an Arrow release and then was on the Arrow app, and I think it has a lot wider distribution now, which is criminal in my opinion because i think this thing should have been everywhere right right away but i also think the film's the tits uh yeah <laughs> yeah no it's great it's it's fucking rad it's for for takeaways i want jill to make another feature i want her to flex her creative muscles more and to get more chances to be creative within a feature format i think that this film is great, but I think she could do even better given the opportunity. This is pretty fucking cool. Yeah, what do you guys think? Yeah, um, my my impact and takeaways on the film, it even had me thinking about writing a film about what I do for work and if I was in Claire's shoes, uh, obviously at my work and how I could get away with doing things as a glazier, you know? Mm-hmm. Oh, so, shit. I'd watch it. <laughs> yeah, so, you know, uh, you know, because like if you break down, obviously, the professions that we do, in society, you know, for an everyday job, there is technically, obviously, murder weapons around. Watch us, the know? carpenter. Yes, absolutely. or the cable guy. <laughs> 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 yeah, you know, it, um, you know, we, and the other thing I, I definitely took away from it was like we just rely so much on trust, dealing with, um, you know, these random strangers. When we enter these workplaces, well, depending on the workplace, especially giving them our credentials or address, all that shit, you know, we're basically saying, "Here's my address." kill me later and it's, um, <laughs> yeah. it's it's fucking crazy you know the realism yeah. is there and to me that makes it more terrifying and jill has perfectly nailed that one on the fucking head for this film mm. so bravo jill absolutely yeah no i, I would have to agree it, it's always hard with the the much more recent ones to kind of see the impact because we kind of you know got to wait a little bit and just see how much it sort of picks up um i would love to see in the future more films from Jill. Um, I would just also like to see more, you know, more slashers and and things like that that just have female leads. It, it's just not a thing that exists that much. And like even half the time when there is one, it's a plot twist. Like in Friday the 13th, it's not Jason, it's his mom at the end. And Jallo, and, there's a lot of female killers. But that's yeah, different. <laughs> in, in Jallo, Dario stuff, or Dario stuff and, and things like that. Yeah, it is. Um, I would like to see a lot more of it from American directors. Because mm-hmm. even with like Sleepaway Camp, the whole plot at the end was the killer was never actually a girl. Like And, like, and just things like that. They almost either put it in at the end as a bit twist or take it away at the end as a bit twist. And then you and have... It is a girl. They do a stupid basket case ripoff. Fucking seriously, though. (laughs) And it's. I would like to see that go away and just have more straightforward. Like I think the closest we probably got to this was Monster with Charlize Theron, which was based on the actual female serial killer Eileen Warnos. Um, which I think was actually one of the inspirations for this. I believe it was mentioned in the Invisible Woman visual essay that Alexandra did. But I would just like to see more of this. I would like to see more impact to this. 
is. Um, and takeaways. Damn, man, I'm just happy to see my damn city in a, in a movie. <laughs> like, <laughs> <laughs> uh, it just makes me so happy to, to see it. Uh, I hope we get to be in more movies <laughs> in the future, too. <laughs> Rating, boys. Mentally unstable hairstylist with murderous tendencies out of five. Brody, start us off. I'm going to give it a 3.9. Okay. Slick Nick? 4.4. I'm going to give it a 4.8. And that is an LCE score of 4.4 out of 5 mentally unstable hairstylists with murderous tendencies. Fucking A. I'm excited. (laughs) Yeah, that was a great episode. And that was a great fucking movie. And I want to say thank you to Jill for providing that awesome intro to this episode. It means a lot. Thank you. Like, seriously, from the bottom of our hearts, thank you. It was rad. And I think that that's what really uh, motivates us to keep making these shows. Well, that and the iTunes charts, but whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> that was the rampant self-validation. That goes- <laughs> that just watch the number get bigger. Exactly. <laughs> Well, next episode is 1988 Scarecrows, which is a Brody pick, and that will be episode 29. That means we're finishing up the season very, very soon. And uh, as always, we will take a short hiatus, but then we will be back with another hard-hitting season of great exploitative films for you all. But I think that's all we have for this episode of your favorite podcast, Lights, Camera, Exploitation. This is the pod boss, TJ Bowser, signing off. This is your doppelganger, Kanga Banger, all the way from motherfucking down under saying i'll catch you mother lickers next week slick nick with the biggest letdown of the outro because i don't have anything to say i love you thank you for listening